Hi everyone, thank you very much for joining us today where we will run through a complete beginner's guide to housing retrofit. My name is Stephen Gerrard, Senior Consultant working in the Sustainability Team at Turner and Townsend, and I'm also a qualified and accredited retrofit coordinator, having worked on several large scale retrofit programmes across the UK over the last few years. On completion of today's session, I'm hoping everyone will be more confident in understanding what energy retrofitting actually is. We will review some of the key terms used within industry, identifying some of the key roles and responsibilities to ensure that your project is a success. Before finishing up with a look at some examples of funding for retrofit projects and what support is available through the Social Housing Retrofit Accelerator programme. So just to give a little context and explain where domestic buildings play a role. Residential properties are responsible for 23% of the UK's carbon emissions. Three quarters of these emissions come from domestic heating. Many homes are inefficient, have poor or no insulation and drafts, which allows hot air to leave faster and cool air to enter the building. This means occupants must heat their homes for longer and this negatively impacts the environment and living standards with significant energy and associated emissions wasted. To meet our decarbonisation targets, it is not feasible to transition all gas boilers to heat pumps due to the ageing level of investment required in the grid. And there's also a number of other pressures out with the housing sector, such as the transition to electric vehicles. There's around 27 million existing homes in the UK, so it's also not simply feasible to demolish and rebuild them all. And building new homes from scratch is not necessarily better for the environment, given the level of embodied carbon during construction stage. And it's estimated that around 80% of existing buildings will still be standing by 2050, which further justifies the need to retrofit at scale over the next 20 or 30 years. So what is essentially wrong with business as usual? So the way in which we heat, use and operate our homes is not sustainable. The UK's housing stock is the least energy efficient in Europe, with the majority of homes built before the introduction of energy performance regulation. And as a result, they are notoriously leaky, energy efficient and cold. The UK has one of the highest rates of excess winter deaths in Europe, and various studies confirm there is a clear link between ill health and poorly insulated and ventilated homes, which has a significant impact on local and regional healthcare costs. The cost of living and energy crisis has only exacerbated matters with many more households across the UK now living in extreme poverty. These pressures mean it is not sustainable to continue with business as usual, and although this is a challenge, it also pre presents a an opportunity to help the most vulnerable people in our society by lifting homes up to more modern levels of energy efficiency, as well as improving health and well-being and mitigating the impact of a changing climate through good quality retrofit that achieves desired outcomes. What is a retrofit? This definition um, on the screen is taken from Trustmark, which states a retrofit includes making changes to existing buildings in an aim to reduce demand and associated carbon emissions. Low hanging fruit measures such as heating controls or low energy lighting are considered relatively easy and quick to install with relatively low costs. However, intervention measures such as internal or external wall insulation is more challenging and can be technically complex depending on the principal construction, any architectural features, materials and the geometry of the building. The intervention measures will be driven by the client's desired outcomes. Do they want to increase thermal comfort or do they want to transition towards net zero carbon or both? So, Essentially, there's a range of benefits towards the retrofitting of homes to increase levels of energy performance that includes reducing operational costs through more efficient services, systems and a better insulated fabric, improving thermal comfort, health and well-being through a better insulated and ventilated home, 
reducing energy demand and associated carbon emissions through low and zero carbon heating systems, as well as increasing buildings longevity through measures that will help future proof. We may look to retile a roof when considering solar photovoltaics, for example. In terms of health care, for every one pound that's invested in energy efficiency, they have a direct saving of around 40 pence on the NHS, which is incredible and shows the clear integration between cold homes and health. So a failure to retrofit increases risk of extreme poverty, non-compliance with housing regulations, impacts localised healthcare resources and continues to contribute towards a level of CO2 emissions that are associated with the UK's 27 million homes. However, it's not all doom and gloom. Some really great work is going on across the sector, with many social housing landlords um, now embedding retrofit into their asset management strategy and delivery plan. This helps stimulate the retrofit market by creating demand for skills and works that can also help boost local economy through job creation, upskilling and apprenticeship training. So what retrofit options are available? So retrofits can involve some or all of these measures, depending on the project budget and baseline energy performance. Measures such as external wall insulation, for example, are relatively high risk and are deemed as structural work. And this work also may require consent from the local council's building control team or even planning, depending on the location or significance of the building. When identifying any of these measures, it is important to consider the value in terms of payback and carbon cost effectiveness to determine what the impact will look like. Depending on the client, um, they may um, have you know, various drivers, for example, social housing providers may not be too concerned about payback as this is seen as an investment in their housing stock um, to achieve a, a minimum performance level rather than a, a reduction in operational costs. Measures shouldn't be implemented in isolation, for example, when improving their tightness through insulation. It is important to develop an appropriate ventilation strategy simultaneously to reduce the risk of unintended consequences. Here are some examples of several energy efficiency measures, including floor insulation between the joists, a ground mounted air source heat pump, external wall insulation system, a mechanical ventilation with heat recovery system, infrared heating with panels ceiling mounted, and solar panels installed to the roof space. So how is the energy performance of homes measured? Properties can benefit from an energy performance certificate, EPC rating, um, and this ranges from A, which is categorised as very efficient, all the way down to G, which is deemed as the least efficient. 60% of UK homes are around EPC band D or lower, and houses with a C rating or higher are generally considered more comfortable for occupants and can be sold for up to 16% more. EPCs are widely regarded as inaccurate in calculation due to a range of default values within the RDSAT methodology. By law, current rental properties need to have a minimum E rating, and by 2028, all rental properties will need a minimum C rating. Other ways in which we can measure energy performance is through the Passive House Planning Package, also known as PHPP. And this is a building energy modelling tool that's designed to achieve the performance criteria set out within the Passive House specification. This includes calculations covering energy intensity, space heat and demand, air tightness and solar gains. And this is generally a more scientific approach towards building energy performance. So let's have a look at some key retrofit terms. So all homes need full data analysis and a whole house retrofit plan. In a perfect world, each home would have all the measures undertaken in one go. But where this isn't possible, the measures must be sequenced appropriately to ensure there are no intended, unintended consequences. For example, if you increase insulation without a ventilation strategy, 
this could increase the risk of condensation damp and mould. For existing homes, these were never designed to be low energy performing, airtight, have moisture control through mechanical means, and there are various areas of the building that may be compromised if this isn't managed. For example, if you're looking to install internal wall insulation, has the joist ends been considered during the design stage? This is the area that the retrofit coordinator must address and ensure the design is appropriate, considering all the key project risks. The fabric first methodology is essential in improving the thermal performance of buildings, but also protecting its structural integrity in the long term. This methodology generally includes maximising air tightness, increasing insulation levels, and the level may depend on the strategy. Using the thermal mass of the building and optimising solar gains and natural ventilation. There are key stages you should go through to make sure these things are done well and the proposed package of improvements is important. One area PAS 2035 aims to achieve is to move away from installing single measures and isolation, and this is achieved through the development of a whole house plan. It is acknowledged that a deep retrofit isn't financially or practically viable in most cases, so the PAS process and whole house approach allows measures to be implemented on an incremental basis, which is also delivered in a systematic and sequential order as part of a long term strategy. It is important to consider the building as an integrated system rather than individual elements. So thermal bypass is when there is air movement behind, within or across the insulation, which then increases heat loss, discomfort and true energy performance. This also presents opportunity to enable mold growth through the ability of carrying moisture. An example is externally insulating a cavity construction without insulating the wall cavity or sealing this off. This increases risk of air movement in behind the insulation system through the cavity um, and provides perfect conditions um, for surface condensation and mould to grow. So thermal bridges happen when an area of a building experiences a considerably higher heat transfer than surrounding parts, and this contributes to the performance gap. In a retrofit context, it's important we ensure predicted and modelled performance is realised post-construction in an aim to reduce energy, energy demand and associated emissions, as well as achieving thermal comfort. Gaps in insulation such as boundary walls, window surrounds and service boxes are known to have a major impact on heat loss and can result in increased risk of condensation and mould. It's very much all in the detail. Next up is air infiltration, and this is the air leakage through the building fabric and is uncontrolled ventilation that leads to drafts. When the air outside is colder than inside, this leakage can be very uncomfortable, and air velocity is one of the basic indicators of thermal comfort. So, retrofit gone bad. It cannot be underestimated that retrofitting existing homes is risky, technically challenging, and can result in unintended consequences where the correct processes and systems are not followed, and also where specific roles are not undertaken by people with support and qualifications that are relevant, um, and who also have expertise and knowledge. The couple of examples to the left and right show what can happen when the application of external wall insulation goes wrong, and in both cases the design was led through a main contractor, meaning they took on the role of both designing the project and installing the insulation. A combination of huge thermal breaks, for example, at DPC level, roofline and windows, and the application of flashings and insufficient moisture control through ventilation attracts condensation and mold growth, which unfortunately, in this case, deteriorated internal conditions to the point where homes were deemed to be inhabitable. This resulted in multi-million pound refurbishment projects to remedy after the contractors had gone bust. The tragedy at Grenfell was arguably the deadliest fire in the UK in recent times, 
and the investigation confirmed this was started by an electrical fault in the fridge on the fourth floor. The tower block had recently re been refurbished and the fire brigade used a stay put policy, which is common in high rise buildings where a compartmentation strategy is used. And this was changed to a get out command as conditions got worse. During the recent refurbishment of Grenfell, a rain screen system was installed, which included panels made of ACM materials. And the panels had a polyethylene core, which is a highly combustible substance. This ultimately acted as a source of fuel, helping the fire reach a temperature of around 2000 degrees Celsius. Standards and practices have since been introduced to ensure the right people with the right skills, knowledge, expertise and qualifications are involved in specific parts of the retrofit process, particularly where public and grant funding is in scope and an aim to protect the client and public interest. So some key points here on how we can ensure quality is achieved. So in relation to tenant protection, um, retrofits must meet the tenant's needs, the customer's needs with a mechanism in place to report on issues. So in terms of advice and guidance, access to impartial advice, providing comprehensive information about existing and future measures is important. Skills and training, filling knowledge gaps, ensuring people from all stages of the retrofit process are upskilled appropriately. We've now got a range of robust standards in place, some that are mandatory, such as PAS 2035 and a range of British standards. There are also some um, voluntary standards in place currently, for example, such as LETI and Enerfit. Compliance and and enforcement, accreditation and memberships, which include auditing of retro projects are in place, and this includes both desktop and on-site audit practices. This ensures standards are met, and if not, effective redress for the customer is progressed. So good quality retrofit, what is PAS 2035? So PAS, um, is an acronym for publicly available specification. And the 2035 um, iteration was sponsored by the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero and designed by the British Standards. Following each Homes Count Review, um, the Redfoot Standards Framework was published, which included the creation of PAS 2035. And this is a framework for deep retrofit projects that are high quality, safe and fit for the future. It addresses fundamental structural issues that blight many energy efficiency projects, such as defects, unintended consequences, shallow retrofit, poor design and the performance gap. Compliance with PAS 2035 is mandatory for all government funded retrofit programmes. And the PAS standards are reviewed and updated every two years to take into account best practice in the energy efficiency industry and to ensure high um, to ensure quality remains high. PAS 2035 is not a standard per se, it is a defined process that is designed to ensure good quality outcomes are achieved. And this leans on a range of other industry standards and best practice and in many cases exceeds minimum standards that are required in building regulation. The key principles um, under PAS 2035 is a fabric first approach to retrofit, as well as following the whole house methodology. So what are the key stages for retrofit delivery? On the screen here, this is the PAS 2035 framework for delivery, um, and this must be followed for a retrofit project to achieve compliance. A detailed delivery plan will help ensure that a retrofit project is delivered smoothly and successfully. This helps control timescales, budget and helps manage expectations with internal and external stakeholders. There are other processes that will need to be considered in-house before engaging with the PAS process, such as reviewing housing stock and other asset data. So these key six steps of the PAS 2035 retrofit process include identifying intended outcomes and what the 
key project objectives are at the outset. The second step is identifying the risk rating of the property, and these are either fallen into A, B or C um, from low to high risk. And the risk assessment comprises of a five criteria, which measures the number of homes in the project, the number of measures per home, the inherent technical risk of individual measures, the highest risk combination measure, and the principal construction. Step three is undertaking a dwelling assessment, which is generally commissioned by the retrofit coordinator. Each dwelling must be assessed with a report available in the end to present findings to the building owner, and this includes recommended measures, energy advice, carbon and cost savings. This needs to be signed off by the retrofit coordinator to ensure that this is compliant under the PAS 2035 criteria. Step four includes developing a compatible design, including an improvement option evaluation report and whole house retrofit plan if improvements are likely to be staged. For measures in scope during the first stage retrofit, a corresponding design and specification will need to be in place prior to installation activities. This also needs to be signed off by the retrofit coordinator. Step five is the installation phase, and this is completed in accordance with PAS 2030 2019, which includes a handover to the customer. The retrofit coordinator at this stage needs to manage conflicts, um, and this can include the timing of installation works if a range of multi measures are in scope, as well as um, identifying who should be carrying out any quality assurance on site. Should this be done by another contractor? For example, step six is monitoring and evaluation, um, and this is to determine if intended outcomes have actually been achieved. This phase includes completing a questionnaire, um, and depending on the risk pathway and if any issues are identified, that may trigger a much more intensive evaluation exercise to be carried out. And at that stage. This will need to be um, carried out by an independent retrofit coordinator. So let's have a look at some of the key roles and responsibilities. Forming the right project team is vital. It can be done in-house under skilled staff or carefully outsourced. The key members required by PAS 2035 include the retrofit coordinator, retrofit assessor, retrofit designer, and the retrofit installer. The main focus is on the retrofit coordinator as they provide oversight for the entire retrofit process and are responsible for ensuring all roles are undertaken by competent, qualified and insured individuals in accordance with the PAS 2035 process. The chart on the left identifies the various roles required, including the retrofit advisor, who is the responsible person um, that has that first interaction with the customer to identify any issues and opportunities. They can also explore how they're currently using energy in their home and provide some high level energy advice. The retrofit coordinator is to manage risk within a project and to ensure that all other roles are carried out by the right people who have the appropriate qualifications and are generally doing their job properly in accordance with the PAS. The retrofit coordinator is professionally accountable for protecting the client and public interest, including having the appropriate insurances and guarantees in place. The retrofit assessor um, is typically an upskill domestic energy assessor, and they are responsible for collecting accurate information in respect to energy performance, building condition and occupancy. The retrofit designer is typically a design professional, such as a chartered architect or system specialist. They are responsible for developing a compatible design, and in an EWI context, site-specific details will need to be issued to form the project design. This includes understanding how the system integrates with a narrow roof overhang, existing windows. Are these being replaced at the same time, and can these be extended out to the installation layer? The retrofit evaluator is responsible for ensuring uh, an assessment is undertaken during post-installation stage of the project, 
and this is to evidence whether intended outcomes have been achieved. This includes a post occupancy questionnaire with the resident. You can also include other activities depending on the risk rating or if issues have been identified. Um, and this could include air tightness testing or thermal imaging. So let's have a look at a, a couple of retrofit standards. So there are many performance standards that are recognised as good practice towards retrofit. And this includes Enerfit, which is a passive house standard that has been designed for refurbishment of existing buildings and allows for more flexibility compared to the traditional passive house standard to accommodate the challenge of retrofitting existing buildings to increase levels of energy performance. A key part of the Enerfit standard is demand reduction, which includes maximising the building fabric um, through insulation as well as ventilation and other technologies such as renewables. A robust certification process is built into the Interfit standard, which includes an independent inspection and review of the project documentation. And if the requirements are met, the building owner will receive certification. The Letty Retrofit Guide sets out what good quality retrofit looks like for existing homes. The guide defines space heating and energy use requirements targeting a 60-80% reduction. And these targets have been determined through a fabric first and whole house approach based on four primary house types. The Letty Retrofit Guide appreciates there is no one size fits all solution and has developed a specification and performance standard that is dependent on the archetype including age and construction. This is a voluntary standard and although the principles align with best practice to retrofit um, and include uh, a whole house retrofit plan, completing an appropriate building assessment to collect good quality information is vital, as well as undertaking post installation evaluation to determine if intended outcomes have also been achieved. So let's have a look at some certification and accreditation bodies. So Trustmark are the overarching body who provide quality assurance on government funded retrofit schemes. This means that the qualified retrofit professional must be Trustmark registered, such as installers, retrofit assessors, as well as retrofit coordinators. Once retrofit projects are complete, they must be lodged to a central repository known as the Trustmark Data Warehouse. This is designed to store all key documentation and evidence from every retrofit project that is certified under the PAS 2035 process. On the right hand side, we've got the Micro Generation Certification Scheme, also known as MCS. And this has de been designed to certify um, Quality Assure and provide customers with protection for micro generation installations. This includes technologies such as solar pho photovoltaics, biomass, heat pumps, and energy storage systems. Using an MCS certified installer ensures that equipment meets good standards of performance and that contractors have the appropriate skills and knowledge. So some of the main sources of funding and support for retrofit include the Home Upgrade Hub, and this is a support service helping local authorities apply to the government's Home Upgrade Grant scheme. Depending on the tenure, fuel type, income and EPC banding will depend on what funding may be most appropriate for your housing stock. So you can see here we've got a range of funding opportunities from the Social Housing Decarb Fund, um, the Home Upgrade Grant Scheme, which we've mentioned already, Eco4, as well as Local Authority Delivery Scheme. So in respect to the Social Housing Retrofit Accelerator, um, this is a fully funded support service to help social housing providers across England successfully bid into the, the government social housing decarbonisation fund. And this is funded by the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero and delivered by Turner and Townsend. Over 800 million has been confirmed between 2022 and 2025. And a range of proven support which has been developed with and for the social housing sector by housing retrofit and grant application experts. This includes one-to-one -one support, roundtables, masterclass sessions, webinars, toolkits and training.
So some examples of SHDF funded retrofit projects. We've got a few on the screen here, including um, Clack Manager, um, and this included um, a range of energy efficiency improvements to homes, um, as well as more of a, a regenerative um, improvement across the neighbourhood. There's more owner occupiers um, across that area that have now taken up with of their homes, which is really encouraging. Um, in Strood, um, this included the trial of a ground source heat pump, and as a result led to the recruitment of four new people to the manufacturer. And in Leeds, overcame the challenge of meter boxes disrupting the EWI system by working with their contractor to find an innovative solution to insulating existing meter boxes. So in terms of creating a, a retrofit strategy, there's three key themes that are typical to any retrofit project and risks need to be managed at every stage of the project. Otherwise, there may be a risk of not meeting timescales, budget, funding or achieving an intended outcomes. So it's important to plan ahead and aim to avoid delays further down the line that can affect installation times, completion dates and funding deadlines. During the preparation stage, it's vital that you know, you've got a plan on resident engagement on retrofit and energy efficiency as a whole. And this can help provide learning for residents and ease the way in future delivery, as this can be um, integrated with a wider communication strategy. It's important to consider um, senior leadership buy-in within your organisation. And do you have a retrofit strategy embedded into your wider asset management activities? Is there an existing procurement strategy in place to procure retrofit works as well as consultancy? During delivery and post retrofit stages is when the PAS 2035 process kicks in, which includes undertaking dwelling assessments, developing design processes and progressing towards installation phase, which should also be inclusive of a strategy for monitoring and evaluation. So next steps, the one-to-one -one support is available for eligible organisations or consortia. Um, and you can access a range of um, materials, including the Retrofit Essentials course, which is a fantastic course available. Um, includes a range of modules around PAS 2035, data governance, range of interventions, procurement, engagement, contractor engagement as well. You can also learn more through um, accessing a range of online websites, um, including Retrofit Academy. They've got some fantastic um, content on there, including access to qualifications for Retrofit. Um, the BSI website, British Standards Institution, has got a range of standards um, available to review as well. Um, and finally, um, the, the SRA socialhousingretrofit.org.uk is a great source um, of access and a range of retrofit support as well. So thanks very much for listening. I hope that this was interesting.